of colonization and, and its legacies that fly on into the present. There's a couple of issues that we immediately have with these two, with this word. One is the, the assumption of the I. Who is the I? Who happens to be the I? And how does the I become sort of an imaginary? Because it's, you know, is it real, right? The other one is um, this, this kind of passive voice, which is one of the, one of the things that we're gonna talk about. Like, what, what does this mean in terms of acknowledging? Is that where we start, or is that where we end, or is that the limits of it? Yeah, it really, really depoliticizes and sanitizes a really long, violent history. And there's this idea of access. Access to this gathering and to this dialogue. So that one's, that one's the, the, the one that mostly, when we hear this, uh, uh, this acknowledgement, both Anna and I um, look at each other and go, oh, um, and this idea of access. Who has access? How did we get access? How did access happen? Right, and the idea that somehow we just had it, we just, it just happened, right? So, and it really sort of depoliticizes and, and becomes uh, an apolitical um, a conversation. It doesn't even start the conversation, it really stops it, right? This idea that we, we gained access somehow, right? And really sanitizing this long history of colonization and um, really genocide. And it, for similar reasons, we kind of took issue with this language of original caretakers, right? One is the assumption that we are caretakers. We're literally watching the planet die right before our eyes. Can we really call ourselves caretakers of anything? <laughs> but also, you know, this idea of like original caretakers that, um, you know, they kind of this assumption that this land was given to us, that it was just kind of handed over and this land wasn't given to us, it was stolen, right? And to say that it was original caretakers is really kind of like we said, it's sanitizing, it's depoliticizing, it's erasing all of that history. There's also an idea about the original and what original means, right? It's a, it's a, it's, it becomes a, a very much a kind of passive and reductive way in which we think about um, a very vibrant and complex uh, community, so uh, native communities. It reduces them. I'm who are still here. Same, same sort of idea, right? That I'm, I, they're, they're somehow they're still they're still here, but they're stagnated. Somehow native folks have, are still kind of traditional, original back then. Mm -hmm. And so when it, it reinforces this idea that the native uh, populations are still sort of you know living these kinds of traditional lives, and if they're not, they're not real natives. There's all of these issues that emerge from this kind of um, language, and these in many ways um, exemplifies all the things we're going to talk about today. So. Oh, okay. well, go ahead, go ahead. We're gonna to talk about kind of how we're gonna structure structure this too, okay? Um, because we know that this conversation is gonna be really contentious, <laughs> at least we hope so. Um, <laughs> we're gonna structure it pretty tightly. Yeah, so we have kind of two um, overall aims. Is we're really kind of trying to disrupt identi identity as kind of a central focus, because one of the problems that we have with the land acknowledgement it's really a project of representation rather than of liberation. So we're acknowledging, we're including, but there's no responsibility in that. There's no responsibility on our on our parts there. Um, so we want to disrupt identity as like kind of a central focus to understand structural exploitation and structural oppression, um, but also kind of want to reframe and reorient ourselves away from identity and towards um, a, a lens on collective liberation. Um, and so because we have a lot of ground to cover and that this is going to, again, hopefully be pretty contentious, uh, this is kind of how it's going to go. Uh, we're going to provide some context. We'll kind of give you a little bit of time for some small group discussions. The tables are kind of set up perfectly for that, actually. And so you all can kind of discuss amongst yourselves. We'll come back, do some more context, give you another kind of club guiding question. And then we'll have about five minutes for questions at the end. Sound good? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what do we mean by identity politics, the thing that we're kind of focusing on today? When we say identity politics, we're referring to the practice of forming political alliances around a specific social position, such as race or gender or you know, some other kind of social category. Um, and you know, the, the, the term really originally came from the Kambaki River Collective, which if you're interested in reading the statement, we have some copies of it here for you if you want to take on your way out. Um, who they wrote the statement in uh, 1969 uh, to really call attention to the ways in which anti-capitalist work was not also anti-racist and was not also feminist. Mm -hmm. And so really kind of calling for a reframing of anti-capitalist work that was anti-racist and, and uh, feminist. 
And so they came up with the term identity politics as a way to kind of articulate that, the ways in which capitalism relied on systems of racism and systems of um, heterosexism. Um, that's kind of shifted, however, how we use identity. And it really can kind of uh, be boiled down to neoliberalism and the identity turn in academia. So um, as we enter neoliberalism, it's this idea that free markets are the key to economic growth. So if you just make the wealthy as wealthy as possible, it trickles down to all the rest of us, right? We're um, waiting. <laughs> no, right. Um, and so we see all these changes like government deregulation and cuts to social spending, which public universities and colleges took a real hit with, right? This cuts to social spending. And that wasn't by accident, right? Because this is kind of after the 1960s and like the war in Vietnam, for example, and all the anti-war protests that was happening, civil rights protests. Colleges and universities were really hotbeds of activism and organizing. And so it was really no coincidence that they took a particular hit with these cuts to funds. And so what ends up happening is to kind of recuperate those losses, colleges and universities start relying on private donations and private funding, funding from private donors. Um, and as that evolved, it evolved in, from donations to investments, right? When you invest in something, you want to return, right? You want to get that money back somehow. Um, and that investment, that return, was really in kind of this ideological shift and how we understand structural exploitation and structural oppression, and that shift was towards identity. Like we focus on identity and we make it this kind of individualized thing, it really kind of undermines um, social movement organizing and activism like really at its core. And so because of that, uh, we want to talk about identity politics and the limitations of it because it's really been taken up in academia, we've seen it in academia, and also uh, kind of as a result in our activist and organizing work with both Vera and I are heavily involved in. Um, so the, the, the limitations that we're going to outline today it's this emphasis on representation. Like if you just have enough people of color or women or queer representation that that's somehow kind of changing the system. Um, There's the seeking representation with it. Yes, okay. Um, this idea of an internal self, right? That there is such a thing as an internal self. Um, we rank oppressions and commodify pain. Something we're gonna explain a little bit later. And also that it's language that's become passive and reductive or really a movement killer talk about that as well. Okay. So first, we're going to do a little historicizing. All right. So uh, for, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't press the down button. Down, okay. I've never used this one. <laughs> Where did, I pushed over there, right? That yeah. way. <laughs> okay, so we want to uh, historicize the, the concept of identity. So for a lot of folks who've grown up in the neoliberal um, era, identity is sort of the way in which we define ourselves. But that's not an accident. That's historic. That's that's historically specific. It's it's been, it's been coming for a long time. Even though, as a, as you know, as a historical lens, I try really hard not to find an origin because there is no such thing. I'm gonna have to start somewhere. And so what I decided to do was start right here, the colonial legacy. <laughs> um, so we'll start 500 and so odd years ago when you know the um, uh, the uh, colonial powers came from Europe to sort of find a particular place here in the Americas and exploit it and, um, and uh, remove everything possible and take it back to Europe. Um, and um, the processes that happened through that, that, um, that project. So I always think of colonialism as a project because it is a project. It's a project that, re that re uh, requires a bunch of sort of machines um, to it. Right, and so um, through the colonial legacy, you have to you find ways in which to do this thing, which we've called the divide and conquer, um, which you all know about. Right, you divide people so that way you, it's easier; they're easier to you know exploit. So, um, so we have this colonial legacy. The first begins to um, uh, uh, di divide people uh, uh, by race. The idea of race emerges as a concept. It hasn't. It wasn't one before. <laughs> Um, the colonial project that begins to emerge, and it begins to emerge in a number of ways. Um, one of the ways that it begins to emerge is in the, bio in the biology, using biology as sort of the, the kind of uh, rationale for what it means to be um, um, somehow different. And that, of course, is a 200-year-old project, right? We've been working pretty hard at trying to figure out how we are biologically different. And of course, the current um, you know, medical profession says we're, we're actually not. Um, but, uh, but we've been working pretty hard at it, and it's embedded in our cultural practice. 
So much so that the idea of cultural deficit has become um, sort of a, an idea in the way in which we think about ourselves, right? So some people are advanced and some people are not. The primitive and the civilized. Um, and then, of course, uh, you embed in the US consciousness the ideology of white supremacy, which, of course, is so much more clear now than usually. <laughs> For many of us who are old enough to remember this, um, white supremacy was sort of a, like a deal thing, you know, but it's certainly out in the open now, and, um, and in, in certain ways it allows us to think about it more clearly. So what you get then, of course, is that um, through these structures, through the medical profession, through the anthropologists, through the, the, um, the armed forces, through the institutions, through the church, through religion, all of these working together, they create these constructions, these, these things that then they put out into the social realm, which we then reproduce um, with each other. Um, and we start seeing things like race. We see race in the institutions, it's institutionalized, it's made into discourses or language, we speak it, we begin to see things like black becoming a thing, right? So you are no longer just dark skinned and happen to be from a place, but now you are black. And black actually means something. Right? And, um, and you begin to see things like um, the construction of the homosexual as, an, as a kind of a, a thing to study. And so now you are not, you don't have desires, but you are now in, in it's, it's internalized, and you become these constructions. And you work, you uh, go through your day inside of a capitalist context using those particular kinds of labels. Why? Because they're everywhere, and we do it to each other, right? How, how do you identify? But it begins to, to fragment us in ways, right? We begin to internalize these things, and they become discursive, and they, they st we start throwing them around in each other. Um, and then, um, so then, uh, so then what happens is we start realizing after World War II, well, well before, but certainly by World War II, we start realizing that um, there are bigger structures at, um, at play. And these bigger structures are at play on all of us, no matter who you are. Um, and these bigger structures are starting to become much more on the rise. And you get, um, you get a huge, beginning with um, the labor movement in the 1920s and 1930s, that really give us language about the ways in which exploitation works. And then you get, uh, after World War II, the civil rights movement, which begins to sort of do the same. The women's rights movement, LGBTQ movement, queer movements, begin to sort of take hold. And they are all very much invested in this idea that there is a larger structure that is working upon us. And it works upon us differentially. So Malcolm X is um, one of my favorite quotes that he gives, there is no racism without capitalism. He understood very clearly that racism was a product of capitalism. And that capitalism was the thing that oppressed all of us and exploited all of us differentially. And that's crucial. So what you get, right, is that you get these revolutionary movements who are asking for structural change and you have to quiet them down. <laughs> You just do, because it's dangerous, right? Through this neoliberal project that uh, Anna talked about, you start getting this like quieting of these movements, right? And how, and how you do it, right, is you start pinning them against each other through, you know, I'm a woman, I got my movement, I'm a person of color, I got my movement, I'm a queer person, I got my movement, and all of a sudden, right, it's like the liberation uh, of all of us becomes sort of on the side, and we begin to do this kinds of individualized uh, movements that really get in our way. Um, so then these categories that are given to us, black, Latina, you know, queer, woman, all of these are things that, um, that weren't, give, that weren't aren't, don't say very much about us, but we are assigned them mm -hmm. by this larger structure. And it's a project that's been going on for a long time. And so what we do, of course, is we internalize and we can't help it. There's, it's just everywhere, everywhere. And so people begin to sort of identify themselves within these categories. And that's where we start seeing some limits, right? So, um, so that's, let's see, what's next? Oh, <laughs> I wish I would scare you every time. <laughs> every, every slide has a scary picture. Um, of this, this idea, right, that somehow representation, um, you know, is gonna get us to liberation. Um, when we look at some of these people who have really created 
um, and continue the oppressive structures. Right? Okay. <laughs> so we have a, your first um, discussion. Um, so guided discussion, just a, a, five minutes or so within your, your, your little table. Um, where have you experienced being put into a, an identity group? What questions came up for you at the time? For most of you, you remember very clearly being who put into the box, either because you signed a form or somebody called you a thing or whatever it is, right? So talk about that and what um, what questions came up for you at the time. Five minutes. <laughs> of how identity then kind of gets used, right? One of which is this idea that identity is very individualizing, right? We see it as this kind of very individual form of oppression. This is the specific individual experiences and identity and internal self that we have, and rather than seeing it as part of like kind of a collective problem, right? And when that happens, when you see it as just kind of an individual thing, like this individual internal thing, then when you're trying to think through like, well, how do we, like, how do we end this? How do we stop this? Then you kind of start thinking, well, maybe I just need to be represented more. 
needs to be more of us in the media, needs to be more of us in office, needs to be more, right? So it becomes about representation, right? That if we just have more women, if we just have more queer representation, if we just have more people of color, that somehow, that somehow right, just having more of us is going to lead to real systemic change, but I can tell by the groans in the room in those photos. Right? It's a lot more complicated than that. Right? Because is representation really enough when the people that are being included, the people that are making their ways kind of up the ladder, are reinforcing, not even just like not trying, like actually reinforcing the very systems that we're trying to dismantle. Right? And so what happens is that we, we start seeing oppression and exploitation as individual problems rather than issues of structural exploitation. We start seeing it as these things within us and not within institutions and how all of those institutions link up. And when we do that, we're playing right into the hands of capitalism. Mm. We're playing right into its hands and we're actually uplifting and upholding, reinforcing the very thing that's at, at the root of what, at, at the root of racism and, and heterosexism, right? We're, we're upholding it. Okay. <laughs> I have a really hard job with them doing this sort of controversial part of it. Okay, so identity. Um, so one of the things that, um, let's see if it works. Nope, I went the wrong way. There we go. Okay, so so one of the things that I, um, I, I, I always use my partners, my guinea pig, and um, I, um, I have them, um, the other day I said, so, you know, do I, do, do I identify as a man? Like, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then I asked a very difficult question that comes after, which is, how do you know? Mm -hmm. Right? And that question becomes really, really, like, it, it just kind of falls apart. The whole idea of identity falls apart. The, uh, mm, no, he's more articulate than that. <laughs> but, a lot of struggle, a lot of struggle. Like, how do I know? Well, I know because eventually, right, because I'm told. I'm told by all of these institutions, and I'm told by, you know, I'm like, yeah, but those institutions who are, you know, and then eventually we get to a place where it's like, because I'm told by other human beings. Mm -hmm. Other people tell me that I am a man, right? But the <laughs> other part of it, and because I, all knowledge is relational, everything about you is relational get into my argument, that's why I need you to buy into that. Um, <laughs> right, so, um, but this idea, right, that eventually you come to, wow, okay, but how, what are they telling you? Um, well, they're telling me that I am not a woman. That's how I know. I know I am a man because I am not a woman. That's profound. And the reason that's profound is because what it does is it immediately creates a binary, like that. Not only that, but it creates an other. It removes you from your ability to really see each other as human beings. We are now divided by this gender, which is exactly what the system loves. It loves the fact that men and women see each other as so remotely different that all sorts of books are written about, you know, the male brain and the female brain. Same brain. Hey, Brian. Um, but somehow that these these divisions are so 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 um, right. So how do you know? Um, well, one of the things that it does it is that of course right is that identity does does this thing. So how do I know that I'm black? How do I know that I'm Latinx? Because I'm not white. Whoa, right. So now there's white and there's me. Right. So I other myself. Right. And, and of course, by othering myself, I reproduce and empower whiteness. <laughs> right? So here is the one of the kind of the crux of, in many ways, what makes it possible. What makes it possible is this enlightenment project um, idea of the self. Me, myself, and I. I am, right? I am this or that or the other. I become stagnated as a self. I am whatever it is, right? And those things are immutable, innate. They're not moving anywhere. That's who I am. So the self is required, right? 
here's the thing, that of course nothing that you know, right, nothing that you know in the world comes to you without the rest of us. You know you are you because we tell you. <laughs> the people you love, the people that you don't love, um, professors, <laughs> your boss, you know, everybody that you're in contact with consistently reinforces who you are. Right? So knowing the self, there is, is there, so it's a, it's a little bit of a controversial idea. Um, I'm gonna ground myself in queer theory and tell you that, is there a possibility that there is no self without the other? Right? And that's been argued fairly convincingly by, by queer theorists, right? That this idea that the self is really only, right, a, a, a vehicle that allows you to relate. And in that relationship is where you really come to you. So what does capitalism do? Boom, sets up that barrier between you and that other person. And therefore, we are so different that we couldn't possibly organize. My needs are so different from your needs, right? I need childcare. And I'm like, wait, that the kid's yours too? <laughs> right? I need, right? And so all of a sudden, we start really not seeing each other. Here's the thing, though, when we do the split, the system differentiates. In other words, it impacts certain groups more than others, right? So sexual violence impacts women more than men. So then that furthers this idea of an other. But which one happened first? The division, right, or the both? They're intimately bound. So this idea, right, of this is, um, but we have to re always remember that. Is there more? Oh. oh, oh my God. <laughs> 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 <The> representation. <laughs> um, so yeah, so kind of with that in mind, we, we have a second discussion question for y'all. And um, so you know, we covered two limitations of identity politics: so that representation and individualizing, and that conflating identity with standpoint. And so now what we want you to do is we want to reflect on how you answered that previous question about when you were placed in an identity group and the questions that came up for you. Um, did that sense of self come from you? Or did it come from somewhere else? Right. So let's take, for the sake of time, let's take three minutes. Right? And just, again, it's the same people, just kind of mull over that question. No, I'm just, I'm just, that's our question. I Thank you. 
exploitation. It's, it's painful to experience oppression. It's painful to have to worry about how you're going to feed your kids, have to worry about how you're going to pay your rent, um, having to make the choice between groceries and your health care bills. Like, it's, it's painful to live with those decisions, right? So, it, and, to, and so you feel that internally, right? So to kind of latch on to identity is kind of very normal. It's a normal part of political development. But what happens too often is we stay there. We stay there and we kind of play right into all of this. And when we're kind of coming from this place of competition and of scarcity, we, st um, we start ranking, right? We start ranking our oppressions. And that's because of that differential impact that Vero was talking about earlier, that kind of divide and conquer, right? So it's like, okay, well, if there's only this kind of finite amount of resources and we're all kind of scrambling to kind of get that, right, then we start doing this rather than doing this. Mm -hmm. And so we create these spaces that are like, well, I'm a poor queer woman of color and da 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 da, -da. So like I have, you know, so I should hold this space more than this other person. And it becomes this kind of competition as some of you maybe have heard the term oppression Olympics, right? Mm -hmm. Which of us is more oppressed, right? Yes. And when, when that happens, that pain that I was talking about earlier, that pain of oppression, that pain of exploitation becomes a resource. It becomes like a commodity. It becomes something that you can kind of exchange. And then it becomes this question of like, well, whose of our pain holds more currency? Right? Whose of our pain matters more? And when we're doing that, um, we start recognizing this kind of individual pain and these individual resources rather than like collective care. Right? Like how do we kind of take our pains and how do we take our experiences and direct them outward? and look at like, okay, why do I even have to make the choice at all? 
about whether to pay my groceries or whether to pay my health care. Why do I have to make these choices at all? Right? We, get, we stop asking those questions because we're too busy looking here when we're ranking our oppressions and competing over them that way. Right? And again, we play right into it. We reinforce the capitalist structure because we're kind of taking it as given and kind of scrambling for that piece, like kind of trying to climb up and escape rather than trying to transform. in multiple ways is that it really reduces you to these labels. Um, and, then, and that, and that re um, uh, reduction uh, doesn't allow you to sort of realize that you are an ever becoming human being. That who you are today is not going to be who you are tomorrow or who you were yesterday. That you are constantly moving and changing. And that is only the only thing that actually we can take for granted is that change is going to happen. Right? And for many of us who are getting older, we feel it so much. <laughs> or who we'll have kids and we're like, what happened to you? And you're like, no. Um, so, we, so this ever kind of evolving. So identity politics gets, not only gets in the way and it feeds at the hands of capitalism, the big giant structure, but it also stops us from growing and becoming more ourselves. Right? Um, so creating a subject. So what happens with identity is that then it creates the subject that then you can categorize and you know what? The Academy makes a lot of scholarship. There's so much research on the, 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 um, the homosexual, the, the woman, the black folks, the Latino folks, the Asian American folks, the native, you know, they're like, as though we are like these essential groups that now we can study and poke at. It is quite, you know, and for many of us who spent a lot of time reading scholarship, it's quite painful to watch the, these kinds of ideas consistently sort of reducing us into women's brains. Huh? Right? And so um, we become immutable. We don't, we don't move, right? We become innate. That is, we are born this way. Right? And we become essentialized. So there is a core of me that will never change. I would, we would challenge that as part of our argument. Um, <coughs> and naturalize the social categories. So now, these categories have become, uh, are just sort of, they become, in our minds, biological almost. Mm -hmm. right? They're naturalized. Of course, mothers and women are nurturing. Mm -hmm. Duh. And if you're not, then what's wrong with you? <laughs> right? So there's, there's a, rather than you are in a complex human being, and you're going to react according to your child, depending on where they're at. So um, these categories then reduce the, they become really, really reductive, and they really reduce you into these categories and these labels that don't actually say very much about you, right? But what they do say is the way that you different, are differentially impacted by the capitalist system. That, it does tell you, right? Because, of, because the capitalist system sets up oppression and doles it out according to whoever, you know, like, how do I get you to work for less? Right? So I'm going to do whatever it takes to get that done. And then, of course, most importantly, it depoliticizes us. Right? So even when we are inside of our really empowered uh, 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 affiliative group, right? so I'm with a whole bunch of queer folks, and we're going to be fighting. You know, I get, I get, this is one of my, um, this is the one I get. Does being queer have to be political? So I'm constantly going. <laughs> the question, right? The question is so, like, well, queerness was produced out of oppression, right? And that, that is the reason why we became a thing, right? Queer folks is because we were oppressed. And so how is it not political? How can it ever not be political? Mm -hmm. It is political. It will always be political. And one of the things that queer folks did for all of us Right? It's that it's really a, a collective project. They're not, it's not about you know, marriage rights. Right? It's about freeing our desires. Right? And questioning marriage. 
Um, <laughs> organizing a long identity launch removes our ability to make structural change. So when we start fighting within these groups, and then we, 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 we lose sight of the fact that we actually need each other, right? So, um, and, that, and that becomes our main, um, there we go. So here is our grounding, we have a grounding. These are some of about 100,000, <laughs> but I just put some of them. Um, and here's what we want to sort of leave you with. So, um, for sure. So, reframing our analysis away from identity and toward collective struggle for liberation, right? Because, like we've been saying, when, when it becomes this internal self, it becomes depoliticized and it becomes like, well, how do I acquire the saying? How do I survive? How do I maybe just climb up? But rather that we need to be really kind of building in coalition. We really need to see how racism and heterosexism and all of the isms, ableism, how they all kind of come back to this larger structure here, to this larger capitalist structure. And that when we can kind of build coalition that way, we can do a uh, struggle collectively towards liberation. And the, the, the other one is we want you to resist um, disrupt and resist all forms of social categories. Social categories were set up to oppress and exploit you better. So we need to take a, a, a particular kind of stance where we say no to those social categories themselves. And I think the next one is good. Yeah. We need to develop an anti-racist and feminist standpoint, right? So rather than these kind of internal selves, rather kind of see these as systems and understanding that capitalism is upheld by racism, is upheld by heterosexism. And so any kind of anti-capitalist stru uh, structure or struggle needs to also be anti-racist and needs to be feminist. And the final one, use a true and ever-growing critical lens of capitalism as a determining structure. That is how we get our, our food and water today. It is determines our ability to survive. Therefore, it is the place where we can start sort of thinking through how these processes are happening to us and how we can come together. For us, um, the most important thing out of this and is that we really want to bring a politic and, and the, an intellectual project that is about liberation rather than sort of how do we divide ourselves. We want to bring you together and that's, that's our goal today. So I'll just note that technically this, this ends at 1250, so if you have to leave, I want to respect that and know that you can pop out and leave your survey on the table, but for those who are able to stay and continue to engage, please do so. so long but yet so um, new compared to ways to oppress people, how do we prevent something, a new way of oppression to appear when we develop these anti-racist and feminist standpoints because with society, with human history there's, there's a constant way of oppressing people depending on which type of power that you have in each society. So in what ways can we prevent a new way to prevent oppression and then also keep our anti-racist and fem feminist standpoint. Do you have an answer? I, I kind of do. Yeah, I think I, think I kind of do. So, um, I know, right? That is a good question. Um, you know, I think part of, you know, how these categories work is they're very alienating, right? They alienate us from each other and they kind of alienate us from ourselves and really kind of prevent us from looking at that larger structure. Um, and, you know, we're both kind of coming from this, uh, this idea of kind of human nature and human nature being kind of production and work and how we take from and how that gets exploited, right? The very thing that makes us um, human gets exploited and we kind of get separated from it. So part of, um, you know, when we're talking about how do we prevent these struggles, I think a common trap that we find into is, is we spend a lot of time thinking about what we're against 
Mm -hmm. uh, but we don't spend a lot of time thinking about what we're for. Mm -hmm. And so when you're able to kind of reframe that, when you're able to kind of work in coalition with each other and really kind of see the connections and how all these systems come together towards this kind of larger structure, and that larger structure starts to become more legible, um, you're kind of starting from a place of, um, when you're coming from a place of coalition, you're coming from a place where those divisions don't exist. Um, or at least are diminished. And so then I think that makes it a lot easier to kind of envision something that's really kind of for everyone, right? And that's structured for everyone, rather than based on these kind of social categories. So and one of the things that we were asking you to develop is this kind of true and ever growing critical lens towards capitalism. And, and capitalism is, a, is, is really one form uh, in, that, that, we're, that produced all of these things that we now <coughs> call identities. Um, but before that, there was already other systems, right? That were, yeah. And that had to do with this kind of inequity, right? This a huge kind of inequity where the resources are placed in very few hands. And that's one thing that we can link, right? In terms of exploitation, oppression, we can link that to that, that process. It's a long process, a cumulative, a primitive accumulation where a whole bunch of people, or very few people, got a whole bunch of resources in their hands and then they're like, mine, mine, mine. So, um, so should we take it from them? Good question. Guess what my answer would be. <laughs> are 
having their roots in capitalism, right? That's why we did spend some, like eugenics is a classic example, right, of how we kind of construct meaning around bodies and categorizing bodies and what is a normal body and what does a normal body look like and how do we kind of discipline that, right? Um, but even those categories also come back to these histories of, of race and, and gender, like I'm thinking of Buck v. Bell, right? So Carrie Bell, who was um, forcefully sterilized, right, for being, um, for imbecility, right? Um, she had no developmental disability that we could see it. It was a cover up for a rape by the family, uh, the nephew of the family that was that she was living with, right? You know, so it's 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 about really kind of seeing the linkages between between, right? And how do those linkages come together? Rather than looking at each of these systems in isolation. That was long winded. I hope it answered your question. Yeah. <coughs> you had a question. Uh, how does the difference between identity and an idea that people are shaped by their historical existence. Mm. Meaning, in, like in other places, identity politics, and in, in other places outside of the United States. Um, overall, because like identity politics and the difference between historical existentialism, because people are shaped by their past experience, and also I think for identity politics, like race, gender, and and like expressions desire or something, it's like something they assign you as something like natural. But it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's shaped in relationship always, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, I think one of the things that's interesting about thinking through identity politics and the way in, in, the way in which it works throughout the world is more, uh, just kind of globalized for a minute. So one of the things that my students always ask me, like, globalized, boop. And, so, um, and so one of the things that you want to think about, you want to think about the way in which two projects have worked. One is colonialism and how colonialism has impacted particular. So you can, you know, you can understand what is happening in the Philippines by understanding colonialism first, mm -hmm. right? And then, and then you'll see what kinds of identities are emerging there that are really mm -hmm. like right now. There's an, a, a natural identity called, you know, drug uh, dealer. It's 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 really really important historically contingent uh, label, right? And it means something in the Philippines. Um, in, under the current climate. And so, so you want to think about colonialism and you also want to think about the, the other end of the colonial project, um, uh, the end of it, which is globalization. Because colonization and globalization are the same project, yes. all different names, yes. right? It's the same project, just sort of a big giant machine. So when you think about those two and how those two do, do their work, you can, you can sort of understand, you know, how is it working in Japan? How does it work in, you know, in certain places, right? Why is it in certain places these, these labels emerge? And why do these kinds of identities emerge? Um, that's because you're, you're living different. But the, the processes that you're being impacted by, and that brings us to something that we would, a whole other thing, solidarity. Mm. We didn't even touch that, right? <laughs> but solidarity, right? This idea that you understand what it means, right, for uh, for people who are being exploited and oppressed in other places, right? Mm -hmm. Way across, you know, in another nation, right? Because you understand that the processes are fairly similar. And when you when you develop those the, that lens for those processes, you'll be able to see all sorts of things. So anyway, I think I have to go teach class. <laughs> <laughs> but um, thank you so yeah, much everybody. You.